The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 12545 in the name of Maurice Corrie on Orkambi. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Mr Corrie to open the debate seven minutes, please, Mr Corrie. <coughs> thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, and thank you to the members who supported uh, my member's motion so very enthusiastically over the last week or so. Uh, cystic fibrosis is a devastating genetic disease which has a terrible effect on patients and families. From very early in life, children who have cystic fibrosis can ex exhibit multiple manifestations of the disease, including structural lung damage, abnormal lung clearance, which is a way of measuring airways health, and also face nutritional impairments. The damage they sustain to their lungs is progressive, worsening over time and leads to increasing impairment of lung function. One consequence being that people with cystic fibrosis are more susceptible to life-threatening lung infections. Due to, demographic origins, sorry, due to the geographic origins of cystic fibrosis, uh, the UK has a very high prevalence of the disease and accounting for some 12% of global population of patients. NHS Scotland has estimated that 1 in 24 Scots has a genetic mutation that, if present in both parents, can lead to a child being born with cystic fibrosis. According to the Cystic Fibrosis Registry Scotland, there are approximately 900 people in Scotland with cystic fibrosis. They have a median age of just 21 years old, and the median age of death is just 31 years old. Only 5% of cystic fibrosis will live to see their 50th birthday. And I want you to think about that for a second. My 31st birthday is but a distant memory. But for those with cystic fibrosis, reaching that milestone is just 50% chance of getting to a 50th birthday is, is just 5% chance. Now I want you to imagine if you had died before one or both of those birthdays. Think about what you would have not got to do. Think of the experiences you would have missed, the memories created with loved ones that would never have happened. That is the reality for so many that suffer from cystic fibrosis. Surely, it is incumbent on us to make sure that those with cystic fibrosis have the best chance of having those, many of those experienced and for as long as possible to create those memories. That is what Orkambi can do. As I note in my motion, clinical data has shown that the drug is able to slow decline in lung function, which is the main cause of death from the condition, by 42%, and it has cut the number of infections requiring hospitalization by 61%. According to the Cystic Fibrosis Trust, around 40% of those with cystic fibrosis in Scotland would benefit from the treatment with Orkambi. Orkambi is different as well from traditional treatments for cystic fibrosis because it is a precision medicine. Traditional treatments for cystic fibrosis aim to reduce symptoms and complications, but progressive damage still occurs, which means that symptoms and complications increase with age. But what precision medicine does is target the root cause of cystic fibrosis, the dysfunctional protein that causes cystic fibrosis. Precision medicines have the potential to preserve or restore lung function, slowing decline and improving life expectancy and quality of life for patients. Further, precision medicines are being developed. Within five years, around 90% of people with cystic fibrosis could be treated with new medicines, that could transform cystic fibrosis from a condition that kills you to one that you can live with. But people with cystic fibrosis are worried that they will not get access to these life-changing medicines in Scotland due to the process that the medicines need to go through to become available to the NHS here. Orkambi well, received its license two years ago, but still isn't available here, but is available to all eligible patients in Austria, Denmark, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and the United States. This is because the Scottish Medicine Consortium announced in 2016 that they were unable to recommend the drug due to its cost. This is despite them acknowledging that the drug is important and effective. Since then, those suffering from cystic fibrosis, alongside organizations such as Cystic Fibrosis Trust, have called for negotiations and a fair, sustainable pricing deal for Okambi. There can still, sadly, be no progress and still hasn't been. People with cystic fibrosis are still waiting for help whilst their health and quality of life declines. And I know that elsewhere there have been success in negotiating prices with governments. And Vertex, the company that makes Okambi and Kalagdeco, 
Another five, five cystic fibrosis precision medication are doing so and have done so. Calideco is actually available in Scotland via the New Medicines Fund following the intervention of ministers in 2013, but Okambi had not and has not the same intervention. It means that the inequality has, that has been created by cystic fibrosis patients and between them, depending upon what treatment they require. A good example of different ways of opening up new medicines is the Republic of Ireland. By agreeing a portfolio approach, which is a long-term solution, that means that when new medicines for cystic fibrosis are manufactured and licensed, they have become available for patients in that country. This deal type means that the medicines both current and future, are capped at overall prices for a set of amount of time, meaning doctors can move the patients on to new medicines if they would better address the patient's particular type of cystic fibrosis. This approach does have made a major benefits. Science is now moving so quickly now that I worry that the older models no longer work for bringing medicines into the system. And in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to quote Mr. and Mrs. O'Neill of Lenzi from my region, who wrote to me and encapsulated what I think this debate is all about. And I quote, my son is 15 months old and he has a future. And he is the future. He, has, he should not be denied access to precision medicines that will support him to live the life which he so rightly deserves. Although not now, Conan's health has deteriorated to, at some point. His life should not be shortened even further by denying Conan and the other 907 people in Scotland who live with cystic fibrosis access to the medicines that they need. It is not just about Okambi, it's about what comes after Okambi, and that is why it is so important that an approach can be agreed that allows access to the pipeline of the future of life-giving medications and treatment. Scotland led the way with access to Calideco, and it must lead the way again. And we must have unity throughout the United Kingdom, along with NICE, who have approved the medicines of Akambi in England and Wales, and we should have the same in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Can I remind all members who wish to speak, pl please press your request, uh, request to speak button. I see some folk have woken up. Um, I now call for the open debate, Alec Neil, to be followed by Miles Briggs. Mr. Neil, please. Thank you very much indeed, the Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I congratulate Maurice Corey in obtaining this debate and indeed in his opening remarks, which I think were very informative and well balanced. Uh, one thing that uh, Maurice didn't mention was that the impact of cystic fibrosis from birth is on average to result in a decline of the lung function on average by about 2% a year. That means by the time a cystic fibrosis sufferer gets to the age of 10, they have lost about 20% of their lung function. By the time they get to 20, they've lost 40%. And by the time they get to 30, they have lost 60% of their lung function. And I emphasize that because this debate is as much about timing as it is about anything else. Uh, because time is marching on for cystic fibrosis sufferers. Therefore, the longer it takes to complete the process to get approval for the new drug or can be, and indeed successor drugs, then clearly there will be time lost for the sufferers of cystic fibrosis. And therefore, I think this has got to be treated as a very urgent case indeed. Presenting officer, the good news is that we are, as Maurice Corey said, we're on the brink of a major transformation in the treatment of cystic fibrosis because of the advanced nature of the new drugs that are coming on the market. But as a former health secretary, I know the challenges that arise when you have expensive new drugs being made available, uh, whose impact is de demonstrable, but clearly when you're looking at the entire picture of the health service, then you have to be mindful of the cost, not just the unit cost, but the overall cost of any new drug. And that's why the SMC system was set up to take an objective, non-political look at it. But sometimes it's necessary for government to knock heads together. And I think the stage we're at just now, particularly with our Cambi, is that we need the government to knock their heads together or vertex the manufacturer 
and the SMC and NSS who are responsible for the procurement on behalf of the Scottish Government. And it's right that politicians are not directly involved. The role of politicians is to set the framework and, if necessary, to intervene where there is undue delay. And therefore, what I want to concentrate on for the rest of my speech is making a suggestion to the Scottish Government and to Vertex about the way ahead. Because the one thing we're all united about is the need to do everything we possibly can within our power and budget and resources to make sure that the sufferers of cystic fibrosis get the treatment they need and get it at the earliest possible opportunity. Now, I welcome the decision, which became effective about two weeks ago, uh, to make or can be available under what used to be called the individual patient request system. And that's progress, but it's not enough progress. Because as we know, uh, getting approval is not always fast and it's not always guaranteed. And that's why the quicker we get general approval for this drug, the better. And I believe the time has come. Yep, sure. Mem I'm sorry, uh, you've got only 30 seconds oh, left. Right. I'm sure you want to use them. Okay. So, so the time has come, I think, for the Scottish Government to knock heads together. A vertex on the one hand, and the NSS on the other. And I think the two things that are necessary are this. First of all, the agreement of the government to enter into what are called portfolio negotiations, and these are out with due process. This is a novel way of negotiating access to these drugs. But don't let bureaucracy and being outside due process hold us up. Authorize the start of those discussions. They won't be finished quickly. But in the meantime, presiding officer, I believe that Vertex should make the drug available at some kind of reduced price so that when the deal is done, then both sides end up with where we're trying to get to, but let's do it sooner rather than later. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Mr Briggs, Thank please. you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And as indicated to you previously, I apologise that I know I'm unable to stay for the whole duration of the debate as I'm chairing the Cross-Party Group on Cancer this evening. I'd like to begin by congratulating my colleague Maurice Corey for securing today's debate and to commend his excellent speech, in which I wholeheartedly agree with. I also very much welcome the broad cross-party support that exists on this issue, and I pay tribute to the work of the Cystic Fibrosis Trust and constituents in my own Lothian region who are campaigning hard to ensure Ocambi is available to, on the NHS to all those who need it. And one such constituent of mine is Jenny Landers from Musselburgh, who emailed me just a few days ago about her daughter Freya, who's five years old and has cystic fibrosis. Jenny told me that every day Freya takes up to 30 tablets, two nebulizers, and does 45 minutes of physiotherapy just to keep well. Even with these treatments, her health is slowly declining. She's already been admitted to hospital three times for, for up to two weeks at a time. Currently, her future is very uncertain as many people with CF are still dying in their 20s. In one year, she will be eligible for Ocambi. This drug has the potential to slow the pace of disease, giving her a much better chance of staying well into adulthood, having a career, living independently, and having a family. Things most people take for granted. And it's not right that we're denying people with CF the chance of that better life. None of us will be able to disagree with Jenny's sentiments, which are shared by so many parents and families and friends of people with CF in Scotland and across Scotland. The challenge, as Alec Neil, I think, really uh, laid out to us, the challenge is how each of us as elected representatives, the Scottish Government, the manufacturer, manufacturers and the processes within SMC translate this desire and the acceptable fact that this medicine is a beneficial treatment and is so effective into access to that drug on the NHS at an affordable rate that is fair for everyone involved and which is sustainable for our NHS. And quite a few ways the campaign to access or can be mirrors that of Progetta and the campaign which I've been involved with recently where women with breast cancer want access to another life extending drug and I'm pleased that the Progetta manufacturers have announced they will be resubmitting to SMC and I hope that we'll see Vertex do similar uh, for or can be in the shortest possible time and I want to commend Vertex's scientists um, they have a large pipeline of, potentially, uh, of potential CF treatment in development 
which could offer a, offer a great deal to so many patients in the future. That's something we should celebrate, but how we make sure the SMC uh, meets that challenge is something I think we all should be looking at. And I, of course, welcome the fact that recent reforms mean that clinicians can now make uh, requests to NHS boards on individual patient basis uh, for them to access the drugs, uh, which are currently not uh, approved by SMC. But such requests will not always be successful and campaigners understandably uh, want or can be to be available to everyone who needs it without delays or extra processes to go through. Maurice Corrie referred to the process uh, through which or can be was made available in the Republic of Ireland. And I think we need to actually examine that, that and look at whether our systems are capable of mirroring this situation as well. And to conclude, uh, Deputy President Officer, I, I again welcome today's debate. Um, it's a real chance for our Parliament to focus and has brought the campaign for a can be to our Parliament. I hope that the whole Parliament will unite in supporting our constituents who, whose lives have been so improved by access to a can be, which is routinely now available in so many other EU countries and elsewhere. I hope the uh, Minister in responding will be willing to meet with MSPs from across party uh, who are working with the CT Trust and others on this and I hope she'll be able to in her closing speech today ensure that she'll be doing whatever she can to facilitate in getting to a position where Vertex can put this uh, in an acceptable way now and put in another um, application. Patients with cystic fibrosis in Scotland, so many of whom face such limited life expectancies and their families rightly expect the Scottish Government to step up and get things moving forward. I and other MSPs from across the Chamber will keep the pressure on the Government and I believe above all we need to see action on this so our constituents can see uh, and realise their potential. Thank you. Thank you. Call Anna Sarwar followed by John Finney. Mr Sarwar please. Thank you Deputy Deputy Officer. Like others can I start by congratulating Maurice Corrie for bringing forward this debate. It's an important and timely issue and one that has far reaching consequences. Literally an issue of life and death. Um, or can be a life changing drug it improves the quality of life for cystic fibrosis uh, patients. And I think the genuine cross-party support uh, and nature of this debate emphasise how an important issue uh, this is. I recognise this is not an easy issue for any minister or any government, uh, and I hope that collectively we can find a solution uh, in the best interests of patients. Um, it's worth noting, though, that Orkambi is available in many countries across the world, including our European neighbours, Ireland and Holland. It has been more than two years since the drug received its European Medicines Agency licence and it's almost a decade since the first clinical trial started uh, in Scotland. Yet today in Scotland it's still not available to Scottish patients. Uh, and the reason given, and I quote directly from a letter from the Cabinet Secretary's office in inverted commas, justification for the treatment's cost in relation to its benefit was not uh, sufficient. Uh, can I just say, what price do you put on life? What price for life? Uh, for individual families, for individual patients, uh, that won't be very much comfort. So I recognise the difficulty that government has and the difficult decisions that the SMC has to make, uh, but we've got to do that in the context of, of having a genuinely humane um, approach on these issues, particularly when we are talking directly about people's lives. Now, Miles Briggs mentioned that it's uh, not an isolated case. There's obviously the issue of Pergetta, which is uh, also a current uh, running issue. I think that demonstrates the challenge that we have around making access to vital medicines. This is a vital medicine available to breast cancer patients in other parts of the UK but not available to patients here in Scotland that will impact on their life expectancy um, and again I think that requires a robust uh, response uh, and also approach from the uh, government. Can I echo what Alec Neil uh, said in, in terms of uh, the uh, very fair-minded approach that he took, the call that he made on the pharmaceutical company the call that he made on the Scottish Government and the SMC to please do knock their heads together and find a solution in the best interests of patients um, and their families. Um, can I just make a, a few other really quick reflections, Deputy President Officer? Firstly, on the letters that we received from the um, Cabinet Secretary. I, I've got to say, I was really disheartened prior to the letter that came in today, uh, but disheartened by the letter that came on the 31st of March that was addressed to um, Jackie Bailey and Alec Neil. Um, and disheartened because that, that one's a former health secretary, a genuine cross-party approach, and there wasn't a personal response from the cabinet secretary. I think that was um, really ill-judged uh, on behalf of the cabinet secretary. I'm pleased that she has followed that up today with a letter to both uh, Mr. Neil and uh, Ms. Bailey directly um, on the issues. But 
can I just say gently that it shouldn't take the front page of a national newspaper or a debate in this parliament for the cabinet secretary to respond directly to fellow parliamentarians. It shouldn't take that. It, can I also make a comment about the IPTR process um, and the ease of the access to the IPTR process? I, I, I welcome from the discussions that we had um, on, on Progetta about the change in, in approach and how it won't be judged on, on money, but based upon the clinical efficacy, that is to be welcomed. But alongside that, we have to recognise it will still impact on budgets of health boards. So we need the government to back up um, the um, health board budgets to make sure that there is uh, money available to make those drugs available if those IPTR independent individual patient treatment requests uh, are approved. Uh, and in closing, uh, Deputy Bearing Officer, can I just say about the SMC review, although perhaps this is more far reaching than the MC SMC's review itself, there were recommendations in the SMC review that could have dealt broadly with the challenges we face on our Canby and Progetta. The ability to negotiate, the ability to make the drug available while the negotiations take place through an interim accepted period. I please urge the government to knock heads together on the issue of our Canby, to knock heads together on the issues of Progetta, but also get on and implement the recommendations in the SMC review so we can stop situations or limit situations like this happening in the future. Thank you. And can I say gently to, <laughs> I'm about to tell you off, can I say gently to the members, in the, uh, the members of the public in the gallery, we do not permit applause from the public gallery. I know why you're doing it. It happens regularly, but I'm afraid it's not permitted. Uh, can I now ask John Finney, please, followed by Jackie Bailey. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, President Officer. I'd like to congratulate Maurice Corrie on bringing this here. And colleagues will have noticed that my colleague Alison Johnson has waited till the last minute. She has to chair a meeting tonight, but I'm going to refer, uh, Alison's our health spokesperson, I'm going to refer to some of her, her uh, work on this and also some personal reflections. And one of them is that, I, uh, you know, I, I have great admiration for the achievements of the pharmaceutical industry but there's a however coming and the however is, you know, public health should not be in the hands of profit makers. Uh, and I'm quite uncomfortable with what I see as some of the wheeling and dealing that's openly talked about in relation to this. This is individuals we are talking about. And uh, I, I, I think uh, my attention has been drawn to the Just Treatment campaign and the Crown Use Licence, which I know Alison's has written about. And whilst accepting that that's not a quick solution to anything, uh, I think there's a, a feeling that the scrutiny and public concern that may be directed at companies as a result of that uh, intended approach, which is a legal mechanism which allows uh, uh, patent law to be overridden and another producer put in place, um, might result in, in reduced um, prices. Uh, Alison did write to the Cabinet Secretary in the following terms when she, she said she was concerned about a lack of clarity about the basis in which the Scottish Government intervenes directly in decisions about drug approval and purchasing and on the specific, understandably many cystic fibrosis patients feel that it would be inequitable for the Scottish Government to intervene in order to make cystic fibrosis treatments which act on one genetic uh, stratification available, but not so for others. Now, I'm not, uh, I'm not a, a, a legal person or a, or a, a health person. I understand the, about the Montgomery View and the, the Scottish Government have committed to implementing it. Um, I think what's incredibly important is that decisions are um, medically led but of course there's a role for parliamentarians and politicians in this and, and people will be aware that there is a concern about what's seen as the politicization of access to, to medicines. Um, now Alison touches on that when she said um, in that very same letter I believe we now have an opportunity to develop a robust transparent and equitable approval process which is open to scrutiny. One of the review's recommendations is that the comparative review of arrangements for the introduction of medicines in other countries should be undertaken and she goes on to um, commend New Zealand's pharmac model and a potential to adapt aspects of that model in the Scottish context. Um, and, um, you know, um, other members have alluded to some drugs and, and I suspect next week there's going to be another one in the future months there's going to be another one and we must get the process right I think that's most important that we get the process right I'm very uncomfortable when we're talking about people's lives to be talking in terms of some of the sums of money and the reason I have a particular interest in this because I have a constituent Hannah, um, Hannah McDermott um, and I was delighted that her and her mother came to the parliament as my guests in January of this year 
Many of you actually signed a motion about Hannah. Hannah was the University of the Hines and Islands uh, Higher Education Student of the Year. She achieved a BA Honours in Gaelic Language and Culture at Salmo Rostig, and she did uh, latterly as a, a, a distance learning. She was diagnosed at 17 weeks with uh, cystic fibrosis, and her health has deteriorated indeed in the time I've known her. Uh, um, and most recently, she's been <coughs> excuse me, coughing up blood due to a condition which I'm unable to pronounce. Um, and she's just managed to get her lung fun function back up to 50% after it had recently declined to 45%, spending two hours a day doing physio to clear mucus from her chest and lungs. Now, um, Hannah's given me a, a whole list of her, um, of, of her condition symptoms. Um, she's, a, she's a charming young woman and she's very grateful for the assistance she gets from her nurse, Leslie. Um, and, and her mother is uh, deeply affected by this condition. So. Um, Yes, it's, it's very important in relation to this drug. There are other drugs, it's very important. We must get a process right. We must get it right. As someone said, what price of life? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finney. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Emma Harper. Ms. Bailey, please. Presiding officer, let me congratulate Maurice Corrie on securing this debate. It was, of course, a few weeks ago that I organised a cross-party meeting of MSPs with Alex Neil, who, of course, was the former health minister that made Kaleidico available for cystic fibrosis sufferers in Scotland. That meeting was attended by a substantial number of MSPs from every single party in this chamber, many of them here tonight. It was hugely encouraging that for things that matter, we can put aside our differences and join together to fight on a common cause. I organised the meeting because of my constituent, Kelly Gallagher. <coughs> Kelly has cystic fibrosis. She is bright, intelligent, she's a happy young woman. She recently bought a home with her boyfriend, much to the delight of her parents because it meant that she left the house. Um, she works for the local council. She's dedicated her spare time to raising awareness of the illness and raising thousands of pounds to help improve the day-to-day -day lives of those with cystic fibrosis. This debate is happening I promised I wouldn't do this. <laughs> this debate is happening because she and hundreds of others can't get access to Orkambi, a drug that is available to CF sufferers in Ireland, in America, and in the Netherlands. And it's a drug that would enhance her life. And it doesn't just stop at Orkambi. The next generations of medicines that will effectively ensure that those with CF live to a ripe old age are just round the corner. So we have a historic opportunity to literally save lives. But instead of one drug at a time, the pharmaceutical company is offering, as Alex Neil described, a portfolio deal for all the drugs, something already in existence in Ireland, they're in discussion with the NHS in England, in Wales, but not on the same terms in Scotland. Because instead, we're talking about one drug, which is all the Scottish NHS seem to want to do, when we should be talking about the opportunity to access them all. And I wrote to the Cabinet Secretary for Health on the 25th of April, along with Alex Neil, asking her to meet Kelly in a cross-party group of MSPs. I wrote again on the 30th of May, following our cross-party meeting, with the same request. I received a response on the 31st of May, saying that her diary was too busy to meet with MSPs, but that she would meet with Kelly, and that was welcome. I received a further email from her office yesterday, simply noting the second letter, and when I contacted her office immediately to ask if that was it, I was told that she had nothing to add. I have to say, I am really genuinely disappointed. I was then very happy to receive a letter about two hours ago, just before the debate, outlining the PACS2 process, which of course is for individual patients to apply for drugs and the method for appealing decisions. It is helpful, as Alex Neil said, but it takes time, and time is something that CF sufferers don't have. The drug was licensed two years ago, and it's still not available. The Cabinet Secretary has also now agreed to meet with Kelly. That's great. Alex Neil and I have been included but only at Kelly's request. And let me at this point thank the Daily Record for their very moving and robust campaign for Kelly and for all the cystic fibrosis sufferers in Scotland. Today, 
they have highlighted Kelly's plea to the First Minister. And I would encourage members to read her letter to the First Minister. They previously also covered comments from Gordon McGregor, who's Kelly's consultant, and I absolutely understand John Finney's um, approach that says the clinicians need to be on board. But Gordon McGregor told us and bravely spoke out about access to medicines. He had to stand by helplessly while, and I quote, a young man is dying in a hospital bed while the drug which will save his life sits untouched along the corridor. Do you know, presiding officer, when Alex Neal and I agree, you know there is something quite extraordinary happening. <laughs> but we need the Scottish Government to get things moving. Because a portfolio deal plus interim access now is what's needed. And let me finish with what Kelly Gallagher herself said. We shouldn't have to fight for drugs that could save our lives. Some of us don't have time to wait. Thank you. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Ms Harper, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to also thank Maurice Corey for bringing this important date to, uh, debate to Chamber this evening. And I remind Chamber that I'm a registered nurse and I am convener of the Cross Party Group for Lung Health, where this evening the CPG is, uh, will be happening and I'm sure we'll be late starting, but uh, cystic fibrosis and or CAMBI are already on the agenda this evening for us to discuss. And I'd like to inform Chamber that I have sought permission from the Deputy Presiding Officer to exit the debate uh, before final speakers, as I have this long-standing engagement to attend to. So the opportunity to acknowledge the work of the Cystic Fibrosis Trust um, needs to be in the forefront of this because there's been some great work done to raise awareness of the issues and uh, I acknowledge that there's been a lot of um, important work done to raise awareness. Um, cystic fibrosis affects 70,000 people across the world, 30,000 in the US and 900 people here in Scotland. That seems to be like a wee drop in the ocean compared to who's out there. So I think for us, the ability to have access to the medications that can help support people to have a healthier, more prolonged, a life out of hospital and support for the families needs to be considered. For, um, for us, there are other new disease modifying drugs, including Orcambi and other meds which we'll present soon. And uh, I won't go into the details about cystic fibrosis, but I know it's not just a condition that affects the lungs, it's a condition that affects the pancreas as well and the ability to digest protein, carbs and fats. So the amount of medications that people have to take every day, Miles Briggs mentioned up to 30 meds for some people, that's a lot. And so there's a, a real commitment that uh, patients need to, to demonstrate as far as adherence to therapy um, with the adjunct of the meds, the, the care, the physio and the exercise uh, in order to manage their health. Um, so that's really important as well to consider when we're, when we're looking after the patients. When I spoke to my sister, who's a respiratory nurse consultant, and her colleague, um, Stuart uh, Little, they assured me that, uh, you know, they were working really hard with all the patients and colleagues. And um, Phyllis said that the, the drugs that will be available, like Simdeco and or Cambi, which could be available, there is increasing evidence to say that the, the, the research is progressing, the research is looking really good. It's showing that these medications have a direct ability to support the, the way that protein is uh, activated or pushed in order to make salt and water transfer across cell membranes. So I think that when we're engaging with the health professionals and the clinical consultants like Gordon McGregor, when you hear the work that they are doing, I think we obviously need to make sure that the clinical consultants are part of all of this um, process. Um, for me, when I hear about uh, Alec Neal and uh, Jackie Bailey um, speak about the way that the drugs have been managed in Ireland, when we have a portfolio approach, 
My first thought was, how can we introduce a portfolio of drugs when um, some of them haven't even been presented yet? So I was concerned about the safety aspects of the introduction of a portfolio of meds. But I was assured when I met the Vertex uh, representatives that each drug would still be presented as an individual drug, even though a portfolio option is an option that could be approved. And I think it would be worth considering the idea to have a individual approach right now as an interim approach while negotiations are taking place. So I would be interested to know uh, how can the Scottish Government support engagement with the drug company and the national uh, NSS as well as the Scottish Medicines Co uh, Consortium. Because I think if we're looking at this as the year of young people and we're trying to look at promoting extension of the young people's lives. My sister says some people are living to age 51. So in the year of young people, I think it would be great for us to see more healthier out of hospital support for the lives of these folks in Scotland with cystic fibrosis. Thank you. Claudia Beamish, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, and I would like to thank Maurice Corey for bringing this debate to the chamber today. Um, and I want to recognise the work of the Cystic Fibrosis Trust. I would also like to thank Robert Barker, who is a constituent of mine, for allowing me to tell his remarkable story of how he received Orkambi at what he thought would be near the end of his life. His father is in the gallery today, um, and uh, they are close family friends, as it happens. So I've seen the progress uh, of his improvement, but also the other side of it. And they, they, he's in the gallery with many others today. Um, uh, so Robert said, I started Okambi in January 2017. Prior to this, my health had been deteriorating over, sorry, over the years due to my cystic fibrosis. I was having more regular stays in hospital, more chest infections, and, now exp and was now experiencing many other problems associated with the condition. He goes on to tell of the progressive challenges he was facing. In 2016, I spent nearly 100 days of the year in hospital receiving strong IV drugs to treat the symptoms. On the few occasions I was well enough to stay at home, I was hooked up to oxygen 24 seven and could not even get around my own home without being severely out of breath. I could no longer look after my family, go to work, drive or walk anywhere. On top of this, I had to spend most of my day doing my daily treatments and taking nebulizers, doing physio and taking a long list of other medication. By the end of 2016, my weight had dropped to 50 kilograms. My lung function had dropped to a very serious 17% despite all the medication and care I was receiving. I knew I didn't have long left and my wife and I would soon have to explain this to my six-year-old daughter. Fortunately, all this changed in January 2017 when I was pre prescribed or can be on compassionate grounds as a lung transplant had not been an option for me. After three to four weeks on the drug, my lung function had risen uh, above 30% and I was able to come off oxygen. After three months on the drug, it had climbed to 45% and I was able to return to work full time. By the summer, I felt great and I was able to take my family on holiday. I had my life back. A year on from first taking Orkambi, my lung function is now nearly 60%. My weight is up to 65 kilograms, and I'm able to do everything I need to do physically. I have no chest infections, no hospital stays, no sick days from work. On top of this, my doctor has even reduced the several other drugs I've been taking before I got sick. Or can be is an excellent drug. It may not be effective for everyone, but it should still be available to all CF sufferers who may benefit from it, as many of them are running out of time, like I was. I'm sure that everyone in this chamber will agree that Robert's story is both heartrending and also filled with hope for the future, that he can now spend time with his family, lead a normal life, which before or can be would simply not have been possible. As Robert has stressed, and many others have, in this chamber and beyond, or can be maybe expensive, uh, and as Robert has said, it doesn't work with all patients. However, the price of a drug should not prevent it being available on the NHS. And it is important to face the fact that this is about young children 
and how they, they are developing and, and needing a life, as Maurice Corey has highlighted. It's about preventive, progressive deter preventing progressive deterioration. It is very disappointing that the response from the Cabinet Secretary's private uh, secretary only denied a meeting with the very strong group of cross-party MSPs. I've never been to an evening meeting with MSPs that was so well attended and so passionate in my short six years in this Parliament. I, for one, wholeheartedly condone Orkambi's approval for all those who might have their life saved. And I urge the Chamber, uh, uh, I urge beyond the Chamber, but particularly the Cabinet Secretary uh, to, and the Minister who's here today, to listen to calls across the Chamber and beyond, and to ensure that Robert's pleas and those of many others for Orkambi may be made available and it should be recognised. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Aileen Campbell to close the Government. Minister, seven minutes or thereabouts, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I, like other members, uh, first of all, commend Maurice Corrie for bringing forward this debate and speaking with a clear passion and authority and all the members who have contributed this afternoon. And it's a timely debate as it precedes Cystic Fibrosis Week and I pay tribute to the Cystic Fibrosis Trust for their significant campaigning efforts across Scotland and beyond. It has also been a very difficult and an emotional uh, debate, difficult and emotional because who can fail to be moved by the lived experience and stories of people articulated so powerfully by MSPs across uh, the chamber. Maurice Corrie spoke about Mr and Mrs O'Neill's wee 50-month-old boy and their hopes and concerns for him as he grows up with cystic fibrosis. Similarly, Miles spoke about Freer Landers and we also heard about remarkable young women, Hannah McDermott from John Finney and Kelly Gallagher, who will be meeting uh, with the Cabinet Secretary uh, soon. And I'm also pleased as well to see Ralph Barker uh, in the Chamber, who I know uh, as well, and know how close Claudia is to Ralph and his, uh, his boy. And again, thank uh, Claudia for what was quite a distressing thing for I'm sorry, to Minister, say. I will have to. I didn't want to intervene, uh, but we must stop using first names throughout. You've been I, doing I, it throughout. I apologise. I apologise, uh, Presiding Officer, I, I, got, I probably, like everyone else, got caught up in the emotion of it and didn't intend to uh, disrespect the Parliament, but wanted to make sure that I had on record my, and acknowledge Claudia Beamish's uh, sincere uh, contribution there about somebody she knows and who she holds dearly uh, to her and her family. The tributes and testimonies that we've heard this evening, Presiding Officer, highlight the debilitating impact the cystic fibrosis can have, the limitations it puts on life and the need for us to think clearly how to help in the best way that we can. And much of that consideration on how to best help those living with cystic fibrosis was based on the availability of the appropriate medicines. Presiding Officer, the Government absolutely shares the Chamber's desire to increase the availability of medicines that patients in Scotland need. And that is why we sought to reform the systems in place and to introduce changes that are currently enabling us to get medicines to those who need it and we want to build on those positive changes. Between 2011 and 13, the combined acceptance rate for orphan and cancer medicines was 48%, but from 2014 to the end of 2017, under the new approach that we brought in, the SMC approved 79% of these medicines. The SMC provides a clear and consistent process to consider medicines being appraised. And from this appraisal, the SMC determines whether a medicine should be accepted for routine use within the NHS in Scotland or not, a decision currently and rightly independent of ministers and this parliament. But while these positive changes are all well and good, I know that what members tonight are interested in, and more importantly, those who have cystic fibrosis and who we've heard about this evening are interested in, is the fact that our CAMBI is currently not routinely available on the NHS anywhere in the UK. And to clarify the position that I think was suggested by Maurice Corey, NICE have not accepted this medicine. And that is why last year, the Cabinet Secretary strongly encouraged Vertex to enter into discussions with NHS national procurement, and we're pleased that this is, has happened. And those confidential talks are ongoing, and we're hopeful that as part of those discussions, Vertex will make their best offer on price and indicate that they will resubmit to the SMC as soon as possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. Richard Lockett. Uh, can I thank the Minister for giving way? Uh, like many members, I've been contacted by constituents taking a close interest in this issue. In my case, the grandparents of a, a five-year-old girl who has cystic fibrosis. One of the main features of the debate today has been how we can reduce the amount of time between the drug given the green light, if it is indeed given the green light, and actually it being available for use. And I, I would ask for an assurance that will be addressed in terms of reducing that time scale as much as possible. 
Minister. I'll go on to talk a bit more about some of the improvements we seek to make. But again, you know, I think that's why it's important that across this chamber we do make a clear, send a clear message to Vertex to make sure that they resubmit to the SMC as soon as uh, possible. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has also recently updated the Health and Sport Committee on further work that we're uh, undertaking to deliver on the recommendations from Dr Brian Montgomery's review of access to new medicines in order to maximise the benefits available to patients in Scotland. And in doing so, we're continuing to work very closely with our partner organisations, stakeholders, patient representatives and the pharmaceutical industry. I think a call that was heard, I heard certainly from MSPs for us to do. And the use of real-world evidence that captures the outcomes of medicines is also becoming an increasingly important element of our work and was one of a number of data-related recommendations in the review. And this is particularly relevant in this debate as so often there can be uncertainty in the robustness of the clinical evidence where the clinical trial data is limited due to small population sizes. So we'll look to build our use of data to support this. Anna Sarwa. Minister for the intervention, can she clarify by what date we will actually have a full implementation of the review findings. Minister. I'll certainly undertake to ensure that that uh, will get uh, information to uh, uh, Anna Sarwar regarding some of the timetables around the uh, implementation of the review, uh, if he would find that uh, useful. Uh, but we'll uh, also continue to support access to new medicines through our new medicines fund and officials are also actively examining an improved negotiating function that seeks to ensure that NHS in Scotland pays the same effective price for medicines as the rest of the UK. We're also recognising that the current appraisal pathway is less well suited to medicines for very rare conditions and we're seeking to include a wider assessment of lived experience, including quality of life issues. Presiding officer, this is an important element given the need to have that holistic picture of the way a condition impacts upon the life of the individual. But I know, however, that despite the progress I've outlined and the plans that we have in place to improve that further, this will provide some limited comfort to patients who need access to medicines that are not yet available. But it is important to recognise an SMC not recommended decision does not mean the end of the journey for Scottish patients. And there is, as members have spoken about now, a, a new pay process in place enabling doctors to request medicines on an individual patient basis for medicines such as Orcambe. The new peer-approved clinical system PACS Tier 2 process was introduced at the start of this month and replaces the old individual patient treatment requests. And that introduces refreshed national decision-making criteria, standardised processes and a new national review panel to enhance consistency of decision-making right across the country. And that new system requires doctors to now present an evidence-based case to demonstrate their opinion that their patient can achieve a clinical benefit comparable to or better than the population previously considered by SMC. Importantly, though, presiding officer, the guidance is explicit that the cost of the medicine must not form any part of the decision-making process and that arrangements should be only for exceptional cases. And that is why we would again urge Vertex to do everything that they possibly can in their discussions with the NHS National Procurement to find a solution at a fair price and to do so as quickly as possible in order for the SMC eh, that they can consider a new eh, submission to Alec Neil. Alec Neil. I thank the Minister for taking an intervention. The issue here, the crucial issue, and this seems to be the one that's preventing the real discussions between Vertex and NSS, is that Vertex are saying that the Scottish Government won't give approval to portfolio discussions because it's, quote, outside due process. Can we get clarification? Will the Scottish Government now, in the meeting next week between Vertex and the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer, instruct the Pharmaceutical Officer to open discussions based on the portfolio discussion? Because that seems to me the sensible thing to do and would open up the way for an interim arrangement. It's absolutely crucial that happens. Minister. Um, just to clarify again that the confidential uh, talks are ongoing uh, with, with uh, Vertex and uh, the procurement uh, officials uh, as well. But, and I know that he does remember this time during uh, his stint in, in office that there are uh, always considerations that we have to make as a government uh, in order that we can seek to do the best we can for the people that we serve. And I know that the portfolio approach does sound appealing, but we must recognise that this approach involves the NHS potentially entering into agreements to purchase unlicensed medicines, the safety of which remains unproven. Uh, and that's despite some of the assurances that the risk is there and real uh, for our government to have to consider. 
And this approach also risks stopping the NHS getting access to future medicines that may be better and have better value. But again, I will seek to get uh, our officials to uh, look at this. Uh, however, I think we need to recognise that the risk is there around purchasing unlicensed medicine and reducing the NHS getting access to future medicines that might be of better uh, value. And I think we need to be uh, mindful of, of those things. But again, we will ensure that the, uh, uh, I have taken a number of information, uh, interventions, uh, Ms uh, Bailey, so I'm just going to kind of bring my remarks to a conclusion. But we'll certainly make sure that you get the information as I've promised to uh, Mr uh, Neil around uh, the issue of portfolio discussions. So, uh, President Officer, this hasn't, it's not an easy debate to respond to. The stories and the testimonies that we've heard about tonight are powerful and they are real. And I pay tribute to those individuals that have sought to campaign and make a difference because they are inspiring. But what I all hope is also clear is this government's determination to create a system that is fair and consistent, but where needed, has within it the agility to respond to exceptional clinical need and has a greater cognizance of that lived experience. So I think these measures illustrate, do illustrate progress, but I certainly, uh, on behalf of the government, look forward to continuing to work with members right across the chamber. I know that was something that members called for this evening on this important issue and where I have uh, pledged to get back to members with additional uh, information, uh, I will do so uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, thank you and can I commend members on their contributions. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.